The Old Testament lesson comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, and page 130 in the Pew Bible. So I'm going to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. And these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land of flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord your God, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on, and on your gates. The New Testament lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28, page 849 in the Pew Bible. Hebrews chapter 7, starting at verse 23. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, and set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, uh, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for, all, once for all when offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. Will you please rise for the reading of the gospel? Gospel lesson comes from Mark, Mark 12, 28 through 34, page 718 in the Pew Bible. Beginning at March, Mark 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no, there is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is most important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from, and from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This ends the reading of the gospel. You may be seated. We as people really like lists. We like lists, we like records, we like summing things up in bullet points and all that kind of thing. And David Letterman had a really uh, favored part of his show was the top 10, fill in the blank, top 10 whatevers, you know. And then every night that was a, a look forward to feature. And every time when we were, seemed like when we were watching the baseball in, in October with the playoffs and all that, anytime something good happened, 
It seemed like they say, well, that was a new record for something. You know, with how many triples? Well, he was, I don't know, who knows what. But there's always records being set, and people like to keep track of those things and sum up stuff and make lists. And the same is true religiously. And in the, uh, Jesus wasn't the first person that was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Uh, Rabbi, I think Hillel was the one, was asked one time if he could sum up uh, the Bible, the teaching of the law, while standing on one foot. Now, the guy must have thought he really was going to have him stumped here because, you know, the Bible's pretty long. It was long for them, too. And they had scrolls, so, you know, they had like a whole wall full of scrolls. That's how long the Bible is, the Old Testament. So he thought he was going to have Rabbi Hillel stumped, and Hillel just lifted up uh, one foot and said, what is hateful to you, do not to others. Same, you know, kind of a, a negative form. It's the golden rule. That's the law and the prophets. That's the summary of the Bible. And so this scribe in today's gospel also came with the question. Matthew says he came in order to test Jesus. And he asked him that very question of all the commandments, which is the most important. The most important one, Jesus said, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment, the summary of the Bible's teaching, according to Jesus. So today I want to look at the first part. Next week I'll look at the second part, love your neighbor as yourself. But I want to focus more on love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come looking at your word this day, I ask that you give me words to say, I ask that you would give us ears to hear. Most of all, it gives us hearts to believe and to repent where we need to and to live for you. We ask that your fruit, your word, would bear good fruit in our lives and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength? Is Jesus trying to teach us that we're kind of a four-compartment type of being? Other places, it's just heart and uh, and mind and strength, and he adds soul, you know, here. Uh, but are we a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body? Well, that's not really the point. The point is to love God with all you've got, to give 110%, to be all in, however you want to say it. That's the point, to love God with all your being. If you've ever fallen in love, and most of us have at some type, time or another, can you remember what it's like? assuming you aren't currently, think about what it's like. Your thoughts center on that person whom you're in love with. Everything you do is geared toward that person, towards pleasing that person. And what do you talk about? You talk about that person. Sometimes, you know, other people say, can't you think of anything else? No, I can't. You only want to talk about them to others, and you only want to be with them. Things just aren't right. You know, songs talk about you feel hot and cold, and you don't, you know, you're just a mess and everything else because you're in love. But what it amounts to is your whole world revolves around that person you're in love with. I think about those little models in, in like a third grade science class. You know, you got the sun, and you got all the planets here, and you got that little lever. You turn it around, and everything goes makes all these mad dash circles but the sun's in the middle that's the sun that's the person you're in love with everything revolves around them that's what it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind strength to make him the center of your world of your solar system that's the way we need to treat God and you might notice I didn't say that's how you should feel about God it's how you should treat God as though you're in love with him because you don't always feel it. Sometimes we feel guilty. I don't love my wife the way I should. I don't love my husband. I don't love God the way I should. And what you're really saying is I don't feel 
those gushy feelings in my heart like I did at one time. Does that mean you don't love that person anymore? No. It doesn't necessarily mean that at all. But if you truly love God, you'll sometimes have those feelings, even though sometimes you don't. But you can always live out your love. You can always be in love without feeling in love. It's like, it's like being on honeymoon. Honeymoons don't last forever. And they're a wonderful thing. But after a while, and, then, and you know, those feelings generally last longer than a week too, don't get me wrong. When the honeymoon is over, that's not when the feelings go away. And uh, for some people, may, maybe they don't go away. But after a while, a certain familiarity sets in and you kind of get into a routine and that's when the danger starts of growing apart. But you can still love, live in love. Well, how do you do that? If you don't feel love, what is it love then? Well, uh, Paul in Ephesians 5 quotes Genesis 2, the creation and specifically when God brought Adam and Eve together. Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 5. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So as I want to talk about loving God with all, all your heart and soul and mind strength, I want to go from the seen, from the known, to the unseen or the unknown. Something that's a little harder to get a hold of. So we'll talk about our wedding vows. Now the wedding vows have changed. Now when we were in, get, we got married in the 70s, and of course it was a big deal then, 60s and 70s, write your own vows, you know, make it specific to yourself and, and all, you know, be your own person and all that kind of uh, stuff. But uh, uh, there's some good vows, they're tried and true, and I'm just going to read them just so we kind of recall or refresh our memory a little bit. And they go something like this, generally. Will you live with him, her, according to God's holy word, love and honor her in both good and difficult days? Keep yourself only unto him or her till death do you part. If so, answer, I will. And they both get asked that. And then the second part. I, so-and-so, in the presence of God and these witnesses, take you to be my wife, husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish according to God's holy word. That's our wedding vows. We do that. We take those vows. We commit ourselves to uh, love that person according to those vows. And what is it exactly that we're promising in those vows. And I want to point out five things that we're promising. Love, honor, cherish, to commitment, commitment, and faithfulness. That's what we're promising one another in marriage vows. And that's what we can do with God as well. What is it, first of all, love? That's the first thing we promise. And notice that we're promising. You know, it's kind of odd. Some people think Jesus is commanding love. Well, you can't command love. Well, yes, you can. And that's what we're talking about today. You can't command feelings. You can command love. What is love? It's not for, first and foremost to have warm and affectionate or even romantic feelings, although those come and go. They will be there at times. But love does have three, at least three major characteristics that I want to, want to mention. First of all, love is giving. Love is giving. Love is something you give to something, somebody else. Could be something else, but we're going to talk about someone else. We are the subject, and love is what you give to someone else, the object of your love. The reception, recipient of your love. We give something that's ours to someone else. Or we give ourselves to someone else. And that's really not a foreign teaching. It shouldn't be rocket science. We say all the time, what's the first verse we memorize? God loved the world so that he gave. 
his only son, Jesus Christ. God loved the world so much he gave his only son so that if we believe in him, we will not perish but have eternal life. Love is giving. And God is the best demonstrator of that love. God showed his love for us in this, Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So love is giving. Love is obedience. That's something, again, back in the 70s, we didn't care too much for that part of the wedding vows. Love, cherish, uh, let's, let's skip that obey part. I'm my own person. But love obeys. You want to do what the other person wants you to do. You want to do what's right. Jesus said at the Last Supper, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And just in case they didn't catch it the first time, he told his disciples that three times. John 14, verse 15, 21 and 23. Love is obeying our Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, love is seeking what's best for others. Love is not a self-centered thing. In Philippians 2, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Sounds a lot like love your neighbor as yourself, and it's, it is. It's not self-centered, but others-centered. And the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, those, that little paragraph that describes love, love is patient and kind, does not envy, is not boast is not proud, is not rude, is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. It's a great definition or, or picture of what love is and what love does. But you know, all those things are in relation to others. Love is patient, patient with what? With what other people are doing. Love is seeking what is best for others. So love is giving, love is obedience, love is seeking the best for others. And that's what we promise to God, to love God. When we promise to love God, we also promise honor. How does one honor God? Well, how do you honor people? I think of a judge in a courtroom. He has great authority. But you don't, you know, when you honor a judge, you don't say, hey, judge, how's it going? You might be held in contempt of court or something. You certainly wouldn't, you might get his attention, but not in a good way. You address them properly. Your honor or at the very least, sir, you rise in their presence. You defer to their judgment. In fact, you have to obey their judgment. But to sh you show respect. That's what honor is. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? They were showing honor with their lips. But don't do what I say. So honor goes beyond our lips, although it includes that, but to our attitudes as well. And Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, says this in chapter 1, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am the father, where is the honor due me? If I am the master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord? It is you, O priests, who can show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for a name? You place defiled food on my altar. We give our very best. We give out of deference to that person, their position. Their person. Honor and respect. We promise to honor the Lord when we love him with all of our heart soul, mind, and strength. When we love God with all we are, we cherish the Lord. To cherish someone is to, to regard someone or something as precious and valuable. It's something you don't want to live without. They've got a soft spot right here. 
And it could be anything. It could be anybody. But at home, I have a coffee table that's really not worth a whole lot. As, you know, it's a good coffee table as far as that goes, but it's not valuable. It's not something that, you know, you could take to Antique Roadshow and say, oh, that's worth $20,000. It's not like that. But it's worth a lot to me because my grandpa made it. I cherish that little coffee table because it means something in here. We cherish the Lord because He can't be replaced. There's something valuable about Him. He has given us everything. Jesus told some parables that show about cherishing, about what's really valuable. In Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then his, in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Why? So he could buy that treasure. He cherished that treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. to cherish, to hold something dear of infinite value. Jesus said, if anyone would follow me, he must carry his cross and follow me and die to himself. What good is it to gain the whole world but to lose your soul? But if we cherish Jesus, we have gained not only the Lord Jesus, but ourself as well, our soul and life in heaven. Cherish the Lord our God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Fourthly, commitment. What is commitment? Commitment is when we stick to something no matter what the circumstance. Referring back to those wedding vows. For better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in rich sickness and in health, in good days or difficult days. No matter what, I'm yours. I'm committing myself to you. The outward circumstances don't make any difference. What things look like don't matter to me. I am binding myself to you. The Lord appeared to us in the past, Jeremiah says, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. God did not forsake them. God does not forsake us. The prodigal son, the Pharisee and the tax collector, all these parables and more speak of a God who is always there. I will never leave you nor forsake you, the Lord says. Behold, I am with you always. That's the last words Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew's Gospel. I am with you always. God has committed himself to us, and so part of love is committing ourselves to God, as Joshua did. Choose yourselves this day what God you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Commitment to God. And fifthly, faithfulness. Faithfulness is something else we specifically promise in our wedding vows, and it's something we exercise towards our Lord as well. In the older vows, it was even more clear. There was that uh, little phrase that we don't usually use too much anymore, forsaking all others. There isn't anybody else that I'm making this vow to. You're the only one forsaking all others. Sounds a lot like the first commandment. You shall have no other gods besides me. If we turn to other gods, to other people, to things to make us happy, we're not being faithful. God is completely faithful to us. What he says, he does. 
We don't have to look any further than the rainbow to have proof of that. God gave that rainbow as a sign to Noah and to all of us who have come ever since as a sign that never again would he destroy the earth with a flood. And that rainbow still reminds us every rainstorm of God's faithfulness. And when we confess our sins, we hear it very often on Sunday morning, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is what? Faithful and just. Faithful to what? To forgive us our sins. He's faithful to us. Faithful to our covenant with him. Faithful to the blood of Jesus shed on the cross so that you could be forgiven. God is always faithful. Paul, again, quotes a hymn from the early church that was often used as he's instructing Timothy in the exercises of his pastoral office. Wonderful little hymn that talks about, uh, about the Lord and his relationship to us. It's also one of those trustworthy sayings. If you look through Timothy and Titus, you can find several trustworthy sayings and you can build your life around these things but here's the trustworthy saying if we died with him we will also live with him if we endure we will also reign with him if we disown him he will disown us if we are faithless he will remain faithful for he cannot disown himself god has bound himself to us no matter what if we turn away if we stay close how much better when we are faithful to him in return. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind strength, with all that is within you. Love him, honor him, cherish him, commit to him, be faithful to him. If you've not ever done that, if you've not thought of it in quite that way, if that's more meaning than you've ever given to God before, I invite you to draw closer today. Commit your lives to Him. If you feel like you've kind of lost a little bit, want to recommit, that's fine too. People redo vows. It helps them to focus better. If you'd like to do that today, that'd be great too. If you have other needs, I'm going to invite you for any of these things to come forward while we sing our next hymn. And we'll talk more about loving our neighbors as ourselves next week. But whatever we do, we're here to love God. It used to be an ad campaign, things go better with Coke. Well, things go better with the Lord Jesus Christ. Things go better when we love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. May this be our motto and may this be our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So while we...